Melbourne is voted as one of the world's most livable cities and one of the reasons for this is because of our long established and multimodal public transport system. The ranking of the world's most livable city acknowledges the importance of efficient and reliable transport as being a prime factor and public transport is very much a part of that equation. It seems that the governments of 100 years ago were better at acknowledging the critical need for a comprehensive rail network than our most recent representatives. It's an interesting fact that Victoria as a whole and this region had significantly more train lines operating in the 1930s during the Great Depression than we have today. With a metropolitan population of just over one million at the time, we now have five times that amount and roughly half the length of the rail line to service us all. The Greens have a long-standing established history of recognising the importance of integrated, reliable and accessible public transport in making a city run smoothly for its residents and visitors alike. We recognise public transport is considerably better for the planet and for everyone in our community. If you don't have the luxury of driving a car, if you're very young or old, if you have a disability, struggling with the cost of running a car, or whatever, for whatever reason driving is not an option for you, building new roads is doing you absolutely no favours. Only well-serviced public transport options are going to meet your needs. If you do drive, living in an area with comprehensive public transport options uh, is also to your benefit because it takes cars off the road. And so better, uh, it offers better overall commu commuter safety. And we know for a fact, because it's, it's, it's got a very solid evidence base, that uh, the roads of today are the traffic jams of tomorrow. So if you need to drive to work, for instance, you'll support good functional public transport, which reaches your city, to get people to where they want to go smoothly and efficiently. So it's a, great to finally see the investment, and I acknowledge uh, the current government um, for investing in the Frankston line and the upgrade of the Frankston station. But I'll try not to be too cynical in, in reminding everyone that um, these days elections are won and lost on the Frankston line and so I'd like to think it was good governance as opposed to an election strategy that uh, this, this particular project will be finished just before uh, the next state election in November. Um, I probably can't say the same for the Mordialic Freeway formerly known as the Mordialic Bypass, which at around $44 million per kilometre simply serves to move the occasional traffic jam uh, a further nine kilometres north through remnant green space and some of the last remaining habitat, habitat for, uh, uh, for endangered species. It's going to cut through acid sulphate soils and create sulphuric acid runoff in a complete disregard for the Victorian government's own safety guidelines for coastal acid sulphate soils. The Mordialic Freeway just isn't necessary. If there's a strong business case for it, the government's not exactly sharing the good cheer, which I would have thought they might want to leading up to an election. Once again, I call on the state government to show us the business case and full traffic modelling for the Mordialic Freeway. More than that, I challenge the, the, the Labor government to put forward some real transport alternatives to meet the needs of all residents in this area. To investigate how to best infill the substantial public transport gaps that relegate the South East to a somewhat less livable status than inner, inner city suburbs of this most livable city. We really need an infrastructure uh, in places that currently have none or not nearly enough. And for those of you who, who have lived here for a long time and moved about this region, you'll know that we have public transport lines on either side of the wedge of, of, south, of the southeast, and it's just no longer fit for purpose for our growing populations. Um, I'm a very big supporter of the 20 minute city, and, and at this point in time, it's very difficult for people to actually live and work in their local communities because of the lack of, of transport options. Um, and so let's start with the Loheen fruit. Cycling is such a healthy and efficient alternative to other transport modes as long as bike paths are created to maximise, maximise cyclist safety. Currently, less than 1% of the Victorian transport budget is allocated to walking or so and cycling infrastructure, far less than the UN Environment Program recommendation for at least 20%. We need to significantly increase the budget and work with local councils to provide safer infrastructure for cyclists, 
people using mobility aids and pedestrians. Bike paths are easy to get to, safe and separated from traffic to connect schools, the rail network and homes to low cost compared to other modes of transport and particularly for children to travel to and from school and, for, and within their community. It's also very useful for people who uh, rely on mobility scooters to get around. We support the electrification to the, uh, of the Baxter Line, um, along with Frankston City Council, Infrastructure Australia, and even the federal government. Once upon a time, the Frankston Rail Line extended down to Mornington Peninsula, offering trains to Red Hill and Mornington. Now we have just one diesel train to Stony Point on a single track. This one track accommodates both passenger and freight transport from Blue Scope Steel. I note that the Australian Government has committed $225 million towards the electric, electrification of the Baxter Line, with $3 million invested in the business case. This would be a small step towards restoring rail services towards the peninsula, and we hope it would be the beginning of the expansion of light and heavy rail to meet the growing needs of Frankston and neighbouring areas. There are a range of different priorities to consider when we discuss meeting transport needs in, in the region. Bike paths have to be safe and carry people where they are most likely want, wanting to ride. Bus lines must be affordable and buses are very key in this region, as we all know. Um, they know, must be direct as possible and frequent if we're to expect people to even consider using buses as an alternative. They must be, wherever possible, run from the first train to the last train, particularly to their locations which would other, otherwise have no public transport. They must be fully accessible for travellers, with full accessible bus stops and ideally would have bike racks on the front of the bus to allow intermodal transport options. And the trains are so overcrowded at peak hour that we're pleased to see any commitment to higher capacity and higher capacity signalling. 